appreciate all of you for uh, persevering with us and being great online troopers. Um, we have Jim Pfeiffer back with us today for part two. And this is, he had a very, um, well, uh, eye-catching title for today's uh, lecture, but it is more of history in the Heights. And he, uh, Jim, if you're just joining us for this part, um, is an architect uh, here in Little Rock, born and raised in Little Rock. He's been a part of projects that you know, and uh, well, the Big Dam Bridge, the Capitol Hotel restorations, a beautiful garden in the Heights on Kavanaugh and Harrison. He's also uh, passionate about historic preservation and to that end has created some pages on Facebook supporting the Terry Mansion, um, among other projects in Little Rock and, and, and has been a writer uh, recent in recent years about Little Rock's history, particularly the history of the Heights. And so that's why we have asked him. Uh, last week was murder in the Heights and it was a true crime story that happened in the 40s in the Heights. But today are other topics. So tell us, Jim, what you're going to talk to us about today and welcome back. Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really a great honor to be associated with your program, LifeQuest, and Second Presbyterian Church. Thank you so much for having me. Um, does anybody recognize this instrument? It's a cello. Um, this cello was loaned to me by the Arkansas Symphony. Um, it's actually half size, which uh, it's still pretty big, wouldn't you say? And uh, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm dressed, I'm assisting my wife in her clinic, so I'm I'm dressed in, in clinic attire. And our topic today is um, the topless cellist and other superheroes from our town. Uh, as you can see, I'm, I'm not topless. I've, I've got my wife's um, uh, scrubs on. So <laughs> but I do have a cello. And uh, I don't know. Uh, if you can see it very well, but this is a half-size cello. So you can imagine how big a full-size cello is. And I, I've, I've taken a quick lesson and I found that uh, this is A, so that's A, and that's D, G, and E, it's kind of squeaked. So that's Arkansas Democrat Gazette circulation are the four notes on the cello, four strings. Anyway, I, I thought it would be appropriate to show you this. Before we start our presentation, which is, um, well, let's flip to the, to the slides right now. Let's see, can y'all walk me through getting me to the slide? Yes, okay, so if you wanna go ahead and have a seat, we're gonna start with Zoom and we're gonna press that share screen button. Zoom. Oops, share content, screen. Yes. And start broadcast. Yes. And then once that goes, we're going to push that button on the side, the home button a couple of times and look for your PowerPoint. Oops. I'm back to myself. I see that. Uh, could you see the share content button again? And hit screen. Mm-hmm. Start broadcast? Yes. There we go. Okay, so now we hit that uh, button on the side or at the edge. And we'll tap it a couple of times so that we can look for your presentation. There it is. We ready? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Great. Um, so this shows the uh, subject of our uh, talk today, um, the topless cellist and other superheroes from our town. Um, this is really a survey uh, of uh, historic architecture and 
the people who lived in uh, some of the historic houses in Hillcrest and the Heights been writing uh, for the past five years on a Facebook page called History of the Heights and uh, also have been picked up by a couple of magazines, Hillcrest Life and Heights, Mon Heights Living magazines. And uh, I've been trying to show how important it is to not tear down our history, to preserve uh, our uh, architecture in, in the uh, historic areas. And not only because of the buildings, but also the people who lived in them. Uh, we tried to show that a uh, hundred years of history can be wiped out in 10 minutes by a bulldozer. Um, and uh, we'll start with uh, sort of uh, a group of people who have uh, become internationally famous that came out of our historic neighborhoods. Uh, the first one is Charlotte Mormon, who grew up in this house. This house is on Rosetta Street. It's a small craftsman bungalow. Rosetta is just south of Markham Street um, in Stiff Station area. Um, and Rosetta Street was named for uh, the youngest daughter of Charles Stiff, uh, Rosetta Stiff Blass. Uh, Charles Stiff developed this neighborhood and uh, named the street after his youngest daughter. Um, as you see, it's a craftsman house. Uh, it's been slightly altered, but generally it's it's been preserved. Um, it's got a deep front porch and uh, wide overhangs. This is um, Charlotte on the left. Uh, Charlotte uh, grew up uh, in Little Rock, went to Central, was born in 1933, uh, graduated from Central High in 1951, became interested in the cello when she was 10. And by age of 12, she was, uh, she auditioned for and was accepted by the Arkansas State Symphony. So she was really on a track to be uh, a superstar in the, in the cello. Uh, her parents were very proud of her. Her actually, she lived with her mother and her grandmother there on on Rosetta. And they were quite proud of her. Charlotte went on to Centenary College, uh, and where she had a, a scholarship, and then to the University of Texas, where she followed a uh, extra special uh, cello instructor, and then from there she went to Juilliard and which was kind of the pinnacle of music education <clears> that <throat> still is. And in New York, um, she drew uh, a roommate, uh, Yoko Ono. And Charlotte had really uh, been on a track to be a, a classical cellist, but when she met Yoko, uh, things changed drastically. Yoko introduced her to a whole group of friends including John Cage and, and others who were experimenting with music uh, and art. Um, art was something different from what was on a wall or, or uh, you know, painted on a canvas. And music was different from what uh, plays from a symphony. And um, Charlotte uh, bought into this whole thing and, and really uh, became immersed in it. Um, and, Yoko would dream up uh, certain uh, experimental uh, ways for uh, Charlotte to perform her art. Um, this is um, Charlotte performing nude uh, on a cello made of ice until it, uh, uh, she would perform until it uh, melted into a puddle. And uh, this is Charlotte uh, playing a, a cello made out of television sets. And, you know, it, it sounds like a stunt, but it was very serious art. Uh, they, were, they were very serious about these things. Uh, Charlotte did perform once uh, topless at uh, a theater in 
off Times Square and, and was, was actually, the police were called and she was arrested. And uh, uh, the headlines of the New York Times uh, characterized her as a topless cellist. And she embraced that. And uh, her biography uh, written about 20 years ago uh, described, it, it, the name of it is uh, the topless cellist. This all sounds like um, kind of a stunt, and uh, but it uh, again, they were very serious about the art, and they they really changed um, the way people uh, perceived art. And Charlotte um, uh, became world famous. Um, she was on Johnny Carson, Merv Griffin. She ran a festival in New York called the Avant Garde Art Festival, and was. Uh, really uh, loved around New York City and, and around, and she performed in Europe and drew large crowds. Um, there was an exhibit. Uh, she she died in 1991 and left all of her possessions to Northwestern University, where uh, and who mounted an ex, uh, an exhibit a couple of years ago. Um, that traveled around the world. I, I saw it in New York and it was um, tremendously popular. Uh, she's never been exhibited in, in Little Rock, however. So, you know, Charlotte is just an unusual example of uh, how people can grow up in Little Rock and, and um, you know, excel in their fields, unusual as they may be. And, uh, I wanted to show you that as the beginning. Uh, the second person I wanted to talk about uh, grew up in this house. Uh, Dr. Grayson, his wife moved here, moved their family here in, um, about in the 1930s. Uh, Dr. Grayson was from uh, McGee and uh, he accepted a job as the head of the state health department. And his daughter, Betty Jean, uh, went through the public schools here in Little Rock, I graduated uh, from Central High School and uh, took, uh, was, took part in uh, plays and uh, dramatic performances. Um, and uh, Betty Jean went on to University of uh, Texas and she married a guy named uh, Davis. Um, and they moved to, uh, again, they were both in, in uh, drama and theater. They went to LA to seek their fortunes and Betty Jean Grayson Davis suddenly became uh, uh, a movie star. She uh, became Gail Davis. There was a, uh, she went out there with the name Betty Davis, but there was all, already a, a famous uh, movie star in Hollywood named Betty, Betty Davis. They changed their name to Gail Davis. And um, so Gail Davis had grown up with her, her dad teaching her how to hunt and, and how to use a rifle, shotgun. And by the time she got to Hollywood, the uh, uh, fad at the time were cowboy movies. So she uh, worked with Gene Autry, Roy Rogers, Lone Ranger, Cisco Kid, And um, suddenly she was uh, uh, offered uh, a role as Annie Oakley. Um, Annie Oakley was a, um, actually a real character from the 1880s. She is said to have shot a cigarette out of the mouth of Kaiser Wilhelm. She would perform in stunts in circuses where she would shoot uh, behind her back with a mirror and always score a bullseye. Um, so they, they had a new idea for a television program uh, for Annie Oakley. And it became the most popular program on, on television, also the first vehicle for a woman to serve as uh, the star of a recurring television series. 
The house, uh, again, was built in 1937. It's an English style house. It has uh, uh, clay tile, flat clay tile roofs that sort of imitate the uh, wood shingles that we would have seen in, in England. Um, and uh, it, it was really an honor to learn about uh, Gail Davis, the movie star who continued uh, the, the um, Annie Oakley persona, um, embraced her for the rest of her life. She uh, performed in uh, Madison Square Garden and they had all sorts of uh, uh, souvenirs and, and, and things that that uh, were, were sold for uh, in the mode of Annie Oakley. Um, uh, her daughter, Terry, is a realtor in, in Hot Springs. She went through the Anthony School here while um, her mother was uh, mostly you know, performing in Hollywood. She did... Uh, Gail Davis, a lot of hospital work, spent a lot of time at Arkansas Children's Hospital, dressed up again as Annie Oakley. She was also on uh, milk cartons for, she worked for Coleman Dairy later in her, her life. Um, so this house is preserved. And again, we're so grateful that uh, our uh, local citizens have preserved uh, these wonderful houses uh, there's Annie, uh, Gail Davis is Annie Oakley. Um, this is another uh, person who grew up in Little Rock. Um, um, uh, Helen Gurley Brown, uh, she was born in 1922 in Greenwood, Arkansas. Uh, her dad took a job at the state capitol. They moved to North uh, Spruce Street and then to North Monroe and Hillcrest. Um, this is a cover of her uh, biography. One of her favorite slogans was, good girls go to heaven, bad girls go everywhere. Um, but uh, so Helen had a rather difficult childhood. Her father worked at the state capitol. Uh, went to work one day and um, died in a, a, what was characterized as a gruesome elevator accident at the state capitol. Uh, it changed, it was so bad that it changed the way elevators were designed uh, around the world. Um, certain safety features were, were added. They then moved to California, the, the family to be close to some relatives um, and uh, Helen, uh, Helen's sister uh, got uh, polio and, and was, was an invalid. Helen graduated from school in Los Angeles from high school, went to business school and got a job as secretary, um, supported her family out there, worked her way up, eventually got in copyright work advertising and um, she started writing a book called Sex and the Single Girl. Uh, this is a, a, a picture of the house she grew up in in, in Little Rock. Um, it's uh, again a, an English bungalow. Um, the, uh, so she, she went to Cal she uh, uh, wrote Sex and the Single Girl and then she, she married a guy named David Brown, who was a uh, executive for a um, movie studio in, in, in California. He produced Jaws and uh, Driving Miss Daisy. And so he helped uh, Helen get the book published and it was a bestseller. It was also turned into a movie starring Natalie Wood. Um, and it sold for this, the uh, movie rights sold for the most that had ever been paid for a nonfiction work. Um, she is, is considered a, uh, 
you know, to have moved, uh, at, well, her major contribution then, which I haven't gotten to, is that she um, became editor of Cosmopolitan magazine, and she stayed there for, I think she had the, got the job when she was in her mid-40s, and she stayed there until she was in her 80s, and uh, really was really revolutionized, really, uh, the field for uh, in as, as an editorship of uh, for women. Uh, it was the first time a major magazine had had a a woman as as editor. Um, she, um, so uh, she so she's very serious in in paving the way for women in our country. At the same time, she uh, was very funny and, and in a kind of a spirit of Mae West. Uh, some of her quotes were, uh, sex is one of the three best things we, we have, uh, but I don't know the other two. Um, so that's uh, Helen Gurley Brown, grew up in Little Rock, uh, really paved the way for women. And the handsome bungalow is still there, uh, preserved nicely, as you see. Uh, we'll talk briefly about um, there are a lot of, um, of sports figures who came out of Little Rock who have accomplished great things. We'll talk about one today. This is Dickie Stevens Parks, named for, of course, the Stevens family, <clears throat> but also Bill Dickey. Bill Dickey was a catcher for the New York Yankees. Um, he was roommates with uh, Babe Ruth for seven years and best friends with uh, Lou Gehrig. He was in Lou Gehrig's wedding. Um, this is a house. Uh, sorry, this is a. It's a house he, he lived in, in in the Heights on North Fillmore. Uh, he. Uh, was with the Yankee organization for 30 years, more uh, as both a player and uh, a manager and a scout. He was, uh, was in the uh, Baseball Hall of Fame, uh, was inducted in 1954, and his, uh, some of his family still lives in Arkansas. He was a great ambassador for Arkansas. Everyone uh, my dad actually ran into Joe DiMaggio at a restaurant once and Joe said, asked him where he was from. And my dad said, from the home of Bill Dickey. And Joe DiMaggio said, aha, that's Little Rock, Arkansas. So um, um, another really great individual who, who came out of Little Rock. And when I photographed this, this house was still standing. I hope it still is. Um, also, business folks, um, I've written a lot about those who have done really well in business, came out of Little Rock. Uh, this is a house in Edge Hill. It was, lived, it was uh, occupied by uh, a guy named Tuck Morris. Uh, and a lot of different families have lived here. Tuck lived here in the 80s with his family. Tuck had been a, was a, a lawyer who, uh, back in the early 70s, he was working for a judge. He was noticed by a guy named Fred Smith who saw him performing some legal action, uh, uh, offered him a job and Tuck, Tuck took it and um, went to work for what became Federal Express. Uh, Fred Smith uh, had a dream, um, had a uh, I, he, he wrote a paper when he was at Yale about uh, uh, overnight delivery by airplane, of, of mail by airplane, and uh, he started uh, FedEx right here in Little Rock um, uh, it, for various reasons. He moved it to Memphis, and Tuck stayed with him. Tuck was the son of uh, Byron Morse was uh, the partner in Rector Phillips Morse. Uh, Tuck went on to be executive vice president of uh, FedEx. Um, this is a uh, home of uh, grandparents, a guy named Richard Tallheimer, Dickie Tallheimer, 
uh, began a sharper image. He was uh, graduated from Yale and he was in San Francisco, had an idea about selling copy paper because Xerox had just kind of started up uh, and he uh, got tired of transporting copy paper up and down the hills of San Francisco. He uh, noticed a very expensive runner's watch. Uh, marathon running was becoming popular in the later 20th century. Um, Dickie uh, Tallheimer found a, a way to uh, purchase uh, some uh, more inexpensive watches in the uh, Far East, uh, and he uh, sold his watches for half half the uh, price that they were being offered, and that I think he made a hundred thousand dollars off that uh, particular sale, and he used that to start a business called Sharper Image, which he sold for multiple hundreds of millions a few years ago. This is a English style house on Sherwood Road that uh, his grandparents uh, built, uh, the Tallhammers. Um, this is uh, called the Spanish Courts uh, Apartments, 808 North Palm and Hillcrest. Um, as you see, it's a sort of a Spanish revival style. What I found is that, uh, that the Spanish revival style in in America is really more influenced by uh, a World's Fair that occurred in 1915 in San Diego. Uh, it sort of invented this style. It doesn't have that much to do with Spain, but it's uh, very handsome. And uh, this building was built about 1930, uh, designed by Howard Eichenbaum, uh, who, uh, uh, also designed the Tuck Morris house. So you can see his, his style uh, changed quite a bit. Uh, this was 1930 and uh, Tuck Morris house was the late forties. Um, so I was part of my work in, in writing these articles is doing research. And uh, so the Butler Center for Arkansas Studies is a great uh, collection of city directories. So I looked up 808 North Palm, and just to see who lived there. And the first year it opened, um, this man lived here. I, I saw the name Wilton Stevens, and <laughs> I realized uh, quickly it was Whit Stevens, who, of course, uh, founded the uh, wonderful business that uh, we see in downtown Little Rock today, uh, Stevens. Incorporated. Uh, Whit Stevens was able to afford his rent. He came from a farm in, near Prattsville, Arkansas, and he, he um, uh, bought some belt buckles by, uh, by mail, and uh, they sent him the belt buckles, and he, he took them with him to an army training camp, and he set up a table next to where the uh, the military guys were being were receiving their paycheck, and the first weekend he sold twelve hundred dollars worth of belt buckles, and <laughs> I guess it went on from there. And by the time he got out, he came back. He got an apartment here at the Spanish Courts and went into the bond business, and uh, just uh, was a, a character. It's been called the. Uh, largest influence on the Arkansas economy in the 20th century. Um, wonderful guy, did a huge amount of, of charity work. Um, this is uh, McDonald uh, Riddick House on Hill Road, kind of a classical uh, looking building, uh, was built in 1910. Um, inside, it's, it's more craftsman style. That's really a, a beautiful house. It's just recently been sold for the first time um, for, out of the, the, the family. Uh, a guy named James McDonald grew up here. McDonald uh, had a dream of being an aeronautical engineer. 
<clears throat> and he accomplished that goal. Uh, he uh, uh, founded what became McDonnell Douglas Aircraft. Uh, he, they got the contract for the, among many other things, for the first space shuttle. And he, James McDonnell escorted President Kennedy into a mock-up of the uh, first space shuttle. Um, by 1979, uh, McDonnell Douglas had 83,000 employees in, in St. Louis. So again, thanks to the, the family for preserving this, this house, really a beautiful place. Um, we're going to talk about a few governors, uh, you know, the uh, Hillcrest Heights area is uh, literally full of homes that uh, our political leaders have lived in. Uh, this is a house where uh, Sid McMath lived uh, and his wife. Uh, they um, were the last uh, governor family to have to search out their own governor's mansion because the one that we see down, downtown uh, was built uh, right after uh, the McMass uh, moved into this house and they, they were able to move from here to the governor's mansion. This is a uh, colonial uh, uh, revival house, uh, symmetrical, um, really a really a handsome place. Uh, it was actually built by the Stiff family. Uh, they were in the jewelry business. We already talked about uh, Charles Stiff. Uh, this is his other son, his son, Rosetta's brother, Perry Stiff built his house. Um, and uh, the Stiffs were early uh, owners of the Arkansas diamond mine. Uh, Charles Stiff was downtown in his jewelry store and a farmer came in uh, riding, had ridden a horse to uh, the jewelry store and showed him some uh, funny looking crystals and Charles Stiff identified them as, as diamonds. He sent them to Tiffany's and they were, they verified his, his analysis um, and they were exhibited in, in uh, Stiff's window for the first time. Um, Charles Stiff ended up uh, getting some partners and actually buying the diamond mine. They owned it for a number of years. So uh, Sid McMath, uh, Governor's Mansion. This is Harvey Parnell. Uh, this is a corner of uh, North Spruce and Cantrell. Uh, the Parnells lived here during his uh, governorship. Um, he had a rough time. It's, uh, governor about 1930 when the Great Depression was going on. So he overcame a, a lot of obstacles. So another English style house. It's been painted all white. You can imagine how it might have been originally with the deep red brick on the first floor and there barely probably see some, uh, some wood trim that would have been painted probably a dark green with a stucco and kind of a light gray across the top. So you know, it's changed a lot in looks, but we're grateful it still stands. Um, this is a house that the Bill and Hillary Clinton moved into after um, the, he was defeated by Frank White. Uh, it's been preserved beautifully just off Hill Road. Um, we have some in Hillcrest in the Heights. Uh, we've got um, some houses that um, families lived in who were associated with the desegregation of Central High. Um, let's see. Uh, this is the Lennon uh, house, uh, actually Lennon compound. Uh, Warren Lennon was elected mayor in 1903, um, 1927. He built his family compound. It's just a, kind of a hairpin turn on Kavanaugh as you go up from Hocott's nursery. Um, he built his house on, in the far distance there. And then he, he built a house for, his, uh, for one of his daughters. And then he left a vacant lot in the foreground for Vivian. 
And Vivian had different ideas in building a house and settling down. She went to law school, became an attorney, married a diplomat from uh, the, and, uh, and lived in Washington for a number of years. They, uh, and then she came back here. They moved back here to, a, to a, a building in Scott, Arkansas. She became the head of the Women's Emergency Committee um, to reopen the schools. Um, this is uh, uh, a house uh, lived in by Elizabeth Huckabee on Fairfax and uh, Hillcrest. Uh, Elizabeth Huckabee was the vice principal for girls at uh, Central High School in 1957. Um, uh, she uh, uh, wrote a book um, called Crisis in Central High that uh, was uh, uh, turned into a movie. Um, Joanne Woodward played a Miss Huckabee. I wanted to read a quote by Mrs. Huckabee. She'd been, she said, uh, I could see, uh, she said, um, I could see that when she, this is when she went to Central High, she'd gotten back from a hunting trip with her husband and uh, she went to Central High School to her job and they'd had discussions about desegregation, but nobody thought it was going to be a big deal. She said, I could see the National Guardsmen in battle dress standing thick around the perimeter of the school, they had guns. This has been my school since 1930. Now I felt like I was a foreigner. Uh, Ms. Huckabee was fired by the school board for her um, caring for black students at, at Central High School. And then uh, uh, Ms. Brewer, uh, the Lennon daughter, um, actually uh, headed a campaign to rehire her and reopen the schools. Um, yeah, uh, this is writer's block. Uh, Arkansas and Little Rock has had you know, many fine writers. One of them is Charles Portis, uh, most famous for True Grit, but he wrote uh, several other um, novels that were really celebrated as compared to Mark Twain. He is really a writer's writer. Um, the reviews in the New York Times uh, were always really glowing and he was highly thought of around the world. Um, Charles Portis uh, traveled a lot. He worked in Hollywood. He was head of the uh, New York Herald Tribune, London office, but he always returned to Little Rock. He lived most of the time at the Rivercliff Apartments, which is uh, near Cantrell Hill over on the right. Uh, Rivercliff was built in the uh, late 1940s by a guy named Bill Cheek, uh, and he had some partners then. He acquired full ownership, and um, uh, the family still owns it today. Um, the designer is a guy named Fraser Smith from Memphis who had designed the uh, public housing that uh, where Elvis Presley grew up in Memphis. Um, uh, who can't draw a straight line? Well, <laughs> Faye Jones could definitely draw a straight line. Um, yeah, I was going to just touch on two or three architects who, um, whose work uh, really excite me, who have existing projects have been preserved in Little Rock. This is, um, this is a house um, that uh, Faye Jones designed in Kamek Village at kind of where Pine Valley meets Sunset uh, Drive. Um, this is an interior shot. Um, uh, the house was built about 1964 and really is, is one of one of Faye Jones's uh, finest work. As you probably know, Faye was probably considered uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's greatest student, disciple. Uh, he didn't copyright, he really learned right. He learned what he did and he uh, created uh, his own 
uh, architecture, uh, adapted it to the Arkansas uh, landscape, used a lot of native stone, and um, is clearly our most celebrated architect in our history. H. Ray Burks is an interesting guy. He uh, graduated from Washington University, born about 1891. He specialized in the English style uh, and Little Rock's unique uh, contribution to the English style is we, you can see a lot of rock, a lot of our native stone is quarried nearby, some in the Heights uh, areas in North Little Rock at Big Rock. This is the home of the Storch family. Uh, Ms. Storch uh, was a, a great philanthropist and a board member of many charities, supported, she was on the Arkansas School for the Blind when they, they built the new building there uh, on Markham. Uh, Helen Keller came for the uh, dedication and uh, the only a non-official uh, duty that Ms. Keller uh, attended to was uh, a social gathering here in the Storch house. It just sold for the second time in its, uh, it's built about 1922. Um, uh, Max Mayer was a Texas architect who came to Little Rock in 1918. Um, he was uh, a graduate of, uh, Texas A&M, first uh, architecture school, then went to Col de Beaux-Arts, traveled a lot in Europe. Uh, this is a house he, house he designed in Edge Hill. Um, uh, Whit Nisbet, uh, an attorney, uh, lives here, and his grandmother built a house, the only house in Edge Hill that has been a, a single uh, family ownership, um, and he hopes that will continue. Um, uh, this is another house Max Mayer designs, the Ogden House on Hill Road. Uh, the entrance is actually through that uh, Port Cachere. There's actually a, a auto court in back. And a, it's kind of a grand entrance to the home. Max Mayer uh, had a lot of innovative ideas. He was trained in Paris in the Beaux-Arts, but he really created his own architecture. Uh, um, Dr. Ogden, incidentally, was the founder of uh, Trinity Hospital, which was one of the first HMOs uh, in America. Um, he was banned from the Arkansas Medical Association for a long time with his partners. They called, they were accused of socialized medicine. The people of Little Rock loved Trinity Hospital. Uh, again, thank you to the owners, uh, Trip Strauss, for maintaining this house so beautifully. This is a house that Max Muir designed to Wittenberg Deloney, uh, did the working drawings. It's a French, kind of a French style. It's an Edge Hill also, built by the Frankie family who got into the baking uh, business. Uh, Mr. Mr. Frankie was uh, at uh, um, uh, Camp Pike during World War I. Uh, was, was in the, thrown into the kitchen and he discovered he could bake. So he had, when he got out, he developed the largest uh, baking uh, business in, in the state, had many bakeries around Arkansas and then got into the cafeteria business as well. Uh, this house, again, uh, the second owner, it's only had two owners. Second owner was Dr. Watson, who was our first brain surgeon and his family has lovingly pr preserved this house. Uh, it's built out of limestone from uh, Indiana. The uh, way we identified it was from Indiana was the, the uh, state geologist came out and inspected the limestone and the fossils in the limestone and uh, tracked them to the critters <laughs> to Indiana. Um, this is another house uh, Max Mayer designed. Uh, this, this house is built for Arthur McLean in the uh, 40s, uh, McLean was uh, in the banking business, also in the uh, wood products business, specified to mayor he wanted a wood, wood building to advertise his product. Uh, house was built, uh, house was bought by uh, Mr. and Ms. Bill Dillard when they, they bought two department stores downtown in 19, early 1960s. 
and uh, uh, it really was their first and moved their family here to Little Rock. It was really a, a, a landmark, a milestone for Little Rock to have such a wonderful family move here, bring their business headquartered here. And this home, I don't really know who lives there now, but the uh, Mr. and Ms. Dillard lived here until their death. Uh, been preserved beautifully by the Dillard family. Um, another architect. Jim, Pickard. I wanted to just let you know we have about three more minutes. All right. Uh, we'll kind of uh, we'll kind of talking about Nolan Blass. Uh, sorry, uh, and uh, Gene Levy. These are some architects uh, that I'm um, uh, pretty. Wait, top, wait, wait. Pretty. That's not Rabbi Gene Levy, is it? No, uh, Gene Levy uh, was uh, architect, uh, was uh, oh. architect with the Cromwell firm. He uh, married Mr. Cromwell's daughter, Trudy, and uh, went to work for the firm, became CEO. This is an early house he did for uh, Buddy Williamson. That's gorgeous. Um, then uh, the public buildings, again, that I've written on the Heights Theater, this is the Camac. Uh, house out in um, Kamek Village. It's uh, on sits on 40 acres uh, that was donated to, uh, by the family to the uh, uh, University of Arkansas. It's still used by them. Um, this is, fair, uh, this is um, Forest Park, which was uh, just north of Kavanaugh uh, in the Heights. So it's 40 acres of park. Unfortunately, developers got a hold of it and turned it to housing. So we no longer have a park there. Um, leave you with a couple of thoughts. It only takes a bulldozer 10 minutes to wipe out 100 years of history. And um, a quote by Jacqueline Kennedy, who was pretty much is attributed uh, single-handedly for saving Grand Central Station. Her children are not inspired by the past of our city. Where will they find the strength to fight for our future? Thank you very much. Okay. So, you know, so many of those places I have seen and, and just didn't even know. And then you've shown some places that I thought, how could I not know where that is? You know, I'm gonna have I have questions. <laughs> but we don't have time to get to them. But we oh, I'm we're so gonna have sorry. It's no, all right. We're going to have to bring you back and just have a Q&A with Jim. Don't you agree? A, I think we need a map of highlights so that we can go on our own little yeah, tours afterwards, too. Ask uh, Jim a question, you know? I may even be able to play the cello by next, next time. <laughs> <laughs> we would appreciate it if you did it with a shirt on, though. Thank you. <laughs> you all have a... The dogs are barking. Say bye, Gina. <laughs> all right. You all have a great day. Thank you, Jim, for presenting this week and last week. Thank you all for coming uh, to our week's guest speaker. We'll see you in other classes. Bye-bye.